Hi, it's good to be with you on this uh, last Sunday in the Christian year, the last Sunday before the first Sunday of Advent, which marks the end of the Christian year, and then Advent, the beginning of a new Christian year. And here in the United States, it's also the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And so my task today, uh, what your pastor asked me to talk about, is gratitude. And, uh, oh my gosh, I could talk about gratitude forever. And it's not really because I'm a naturally grateful person, but instead it's because a few years ago I embarked on this really interesting project where I wanted to write a book about gratitude, mostly because I didn't know a whole lot about gratitude. Uh, people said that it was good for you. You know, I watched plenty of Oprah or read magazine newspaper articles that talked about how gratitude was good. And I always thought it was intriguing, you know, keeping a gratitude journal, trying to develop some sort of attitude of thankfulness that people said, you know, just makes one's life better. And so it, interestingly enough, I started writing a book call, that was eventually called Grateful um, and uh, was working on that book most of 2016 and early 2017. And so that meant that I was writing a book about gratitude during the last uh, presidential election, not the one we've just been through, but the one before. And um, that was a pretty difficult time to write a book about gratitude because I wasn't feeling um, very grateful about what was going on in the country. I was worried about increasing incidents of racism, I was certainly worried about attitudes that I was seeing in political campaigns. I was worried um, about the outcome of that last election. And so it was weird to write a book about gratitude while there was so little um, in the world for which I was feeling grateful. And I have to tell you that it's been pretty much the same for the last four years. Um, that the book indeed was written. It was published in early 2018. And um, all during 2018 and 2019 and this year as well, I have talked to thousands of people about feeling grateful in difficult times. And uh, nothing has been more difficult uh, than this year. You know, how do we feel grateful? How do we feel grateful this Thanksgiving when probably most of you, I assume, are going to make good decisions um, about small gatherings and not traveling, um, protecting your families and your communities from the potential of being infected with COVID. Certainly we've had huge uh, financial losses this year. Uh, uncertainty related to the virus, the grueling um, political campaign with all of its ups and downs, you know, and it's still not entirely resolved. We, we think we have a president-elect, but, um, you know, every day you turn on the news and there's something unanticipated. And so literally, I think all of us feel uh, our lives have been turned inside out and upside down and backwards this year. And we might be going into Thanksgiving saying, no, thank you. And oddly enough, that was going to be the title of my book. I wanted to call the book, No Thanks, because that's what I felt like I had, uh, was no capacity to say thank you. And yet it was in the writing of the book and in the difficult time four years ago that I, I actually learned the importance of gratitude. And I want to share with you just a little bit about that today um, in hopes that I can clear the air a little bit for you is that gratitude is really uh, two things. Gratitude is a feeling, and it's a feeling that comes up 
naturally when you receive a gift. That's what gratitude basically is. Someone gives you something or you see like, you know, something beautiful that's a surprise and unexpected. And um, in response, you have these feelings of appreciation, um, wonder, um, is sort of like me, you're giving me a gift. Um, those kinds of feelings, that's what we call gratitude. And gratitude is what psychologists and uh, people who s study gratitude uh, in philosophy, medical doctors, researchers, uh, gratitude is a set of complex feelings. It's not one thing. In, in many ways, gratitude is like love. You know, how can you really explain love? You know, when you, you feel it. And gratitude is the same way. So it's not like, you know, happiness. We all kind of know what happiness is. Or uh, grief. That's a complex thing, but it, we also know what it, what it looks like or what it feels like. But gratitude is, involves a lot of different feelings. But yet when it arrives as a feeling, we know it. Oh, thank you. And, you know, it's, it's a humbling kind of feeling, too. And so gratitude is a feeling. And um, it's situationally dependent in that way. You have to be able to understand that you're getting a gift in order to feel grateful. And so that's why gratitude has been so difficult this year, is that we have not felt like we were getting gifts. Indeed, most of us have felt like, oh my gosh, 2020, go away, you know, <laughs> it, at one horrible thing after another. Uh, tonight, there was actually a thing on Twitter about how the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, a bunch of branches broke off of it when they tried to put it up this morning. And people were saying, oh my gosh, just another 2020 thing. You know, even the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center can't even give us joy because the branches break off. And and that's the way we felt this year. It's been very hard to find gratitude as a feeling. Um, but gratitude is something else as well. And that is gratitude is what I call in the book an ethic. It's a set of practices or a virtue. It's a way of being in the world. And um, when I was writing Grateful, it was fascinating to me that so many of the books that you can go into Barnes and Noble and buy, so many of those books are about gratitude as a feeling. You know, how we can increase gratitude as a feeling in our life, um, how those feelings are good for us, they're, and they are good for us. They're good for our hearts. They're good for our uh, mental states. Uh, they help to, when you feel grateful, it helps to alleviate depression, anxiety, fear, all kinds of stuff. Um, so the feelings of gratitude are great, but what happens when you live in a year like 2020 and you get to Thanksgiving and all you want to say is no, thanks. Let's send this one back to the, let's send this, this year back to the maker. Um, well, that's when we have to lean towards the other direction is that gratitude is also a way of being in the world that it is a moral choice that we make. Now, it's a little harder to explain that because as we, we all know that gratitude is a feeling and we know that when, you know, we experience it, we have all gotten gifts. We've all known those kinds of feelings. Um, but what does it mean when we say that gratitude is a moral choice? Well, it's interesting because gratitude is caught up um, into the ways which we structure our lives. Um, there are people who actually don't like gratitude. And I remember when I was uh, just on the road, my book had just been published. And um, I'm friends with uh, another writer whose work you, I'm sure you know, uh, Glennon Doyle. And uh, she's married to Abby Wambach. And um, as I was talking about my book on gratitude, um, Abby, it just so happened, I gave a speech, a graduation speech. It made it all over the internet. And she was saying how uh, negative gratitude was. And she, her speech was essentially that, you know, here she's this world-class soccer player and everybody kept telling her and the other women on their team, their, you know, 
Olympic winning team, that they should, they should be grateful. Um, and there was all this stuff about how they should be grateful to the Olympic sports committee or grateful to their fans or grateful to this group or grateful to the people who support them financially and all this kind of stuff. And that they, they sort of owed gratitude to all these different people who supported them. And Abby made the point that, well, Hey, not really. Um, you know, women don't owe gratitude to anybody, uh, for opening up a sport to them. Uh, because the women were gifted and talented and athletic and strong and worked hard for it, all of this. And it wasn't an issue of gratitude. No one handed them a gift. As a matter of fact, sports had kept women out. And so to say we should be grateful to the you know World Olympic Committee for putting women's soccer in, you know, in this place, whatever. No, it, it, it's not about gratitude. It's about claiming one's space and standing on one's achievements. And um, I read that speech and I, and I just thought to myself, I, I really understand what she's saying. And I really like, um, you know, Glennon and Abby so very much, uh, very generous and amazing people. And um, yet I, I couldn't help but thinking that she had gotten gratitude wrong. And it's, it's not because Abby is not smart, because she's a very smart person, but the reason she got it wrong is because our culture gets it wrong. Our culture has taught us um, that gratitude is a, is a sort of a transaction, that if you achieve something, you know, or if you're given something, you know, and in the case that Abby was talking about, it was like they were given the chance as women to play this sport. You know, if you're given something, well, then you owe the people who gave it to you a debt, a debt of gratitude. And until you discharge that debt, you're somehow considered to be less than completely moral person. And I think that Abby was making a really good point. And she was saying, no, that's just, that's just wrong. Um, you know, I, I don't owe you anything. Uh, for being a strong woman who used my gifts to achieve this remarkable thing with my team. And I don't have to thank you. And please don't tell me I, I do. And what she was pointing to wasn't that gratitude was such a bad thing, but she was pointing out what is a problem in our culture. And that is what I call corrupted gratitude. And you see what, what that kind of gratitude is, is a kind of gratitude that's structured into uh, the moral sort of expectations that we have of one another um, in a society. That there are gifts that move around and that people who are benefactors um, are owed debts of gratitude when they do something for people who they perceive needed the gift. And so it's not just like Abby and the, and the women's uh, Olympic team, uh, but this is also really a problem with church stewardship campaigns and also things that happen in our culture around thanks, Thanksgiving and Christmas is that we ask people to give money to something and, you know, give gifts to the poor. And then we really do have this attitude in our culture that the poor will thank us. That if we, you know, help out at the homeless shelter, you know, maybe some person who comes in from the cold will say, say thank you. And that they'll appreciate the work that we've done. That benefactors deserve thanks. Well, that is all fine and good. It's nice to be polite, write thank you notes or express appreciation when people work hard on behalf of those who have less. But what has happened in all these situations is that we've structured gifts as if they belong to benefactors who are above beneficiaries, the people who get gifts. And in this kind of vision, this moral vision of gratitude, when a benefactor gives something to a beneficiary, the beneficiary has to return thanks to the benefactor. So it's a transaction. It's a, uh, to use a 
Latin phrase, a, a quid pro quo. Um, benefactors do have tendencies to give in order to get something. Um, there are rare stories. Um, there was one recently in the news of a very rich man who gave away actually more money than any other person in human history. And he gave it away all anonymously because he didn't ever want anybody to be caught up into this structure of needing to thank him for the gifts that he had given. He didn't want anyone to know that he had given the gifts, partly because he didn't really feel like they were his to give. He literally understood his whole life as being a gift and that he had been truly blessed and he literally gave away almost everything he owned. Um, now, in these last years of, of his life, he lives in a apartment in San Francisco with his wife and they have just enough to live on after making billions of dollars and giving it all away. And so what this points to is that we actually do have this moral structure of gratitude in the world that we live around. And it's a moral structure that makes demands on us. It's why when I was growing up, my grandmother who went through the Great Depression, I guess I get to tell my grandchildren now that I went through this thing, this COVID and depression thing. But I remember her talking about the depression and she would say, she would talk about how she, you know, had to be in bread lines and her, fa and my, her, her family almost starved. And um, she would say, you know, I, I, I never want a gift because I never want to have to say thank you to anyone. And, and, and she looked at gratitude and gifts in a very negative way because they had been used against her in a time of incredible need. She'd been the recipient of an immoral form of gratitude and demand. You owe me a debt of gratitude if I give you that loaf of bread. And that's what needs to change. And that's actually where, on this moral sense, that my life has been changed by gratitude in the last four years. It's because as I explored the scriptures and as I wrote this book on my book on, on gratitude, I discovered that one of the major theological themes of scripture is indeed about gifts and generosity and gratitude. The story of the God of the Bible is a story of a God who creates, who gives us the gift of life, who gives the gift of life to the whole of the cosmos and breathes into existence everything that will ever be needed. That God is the giver who gives in the first of creation and continues to give, that we live in a gifted universe. And that God, structures of cre the, the created order in Genesis around those gifts. He tells the first, the first couple, Adam and Eve, uh, uh, the beautiful poetry that we have there in Genesis, he tells the man and the woman, you're surrounded by gifts, take care of them. Watch over them. Increase their, their benefit. Go and spread the gifts. And, you know, we, we messed that up. Um, but that's the vision. It's a gift of creation where we as human beings are given a gifted universe to care for and to till and keep, to make sure that it keeps producing the gifts that God intends. And so even though that, that vocation becomes tainted with sin, it is still there to multiply the good gifts of creation, to spread them around, to share them, to make sure that everyone is fed, that the garden flourishes. And so we get the laws and the prophets and all the wonderful stories of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, and we have 
a vision throughout the scripture of a God who continues to give gifts. Manna in the wilderness, setting a table in the wilderness when you can't even imagine there's anything, a, a, anything that can be fed. Even when the Israelites are in exile or when they, their hopes are dashed, God is still with them. Giving them gifts of compassion, of hope. Gifts of one another, gifts of community. Gifts of a dream of a kingdom that will come one day and that the whole order of the world will be restored as it should be. A universe of free flowing gifts where there are no where there is no oppression, where there is no corruption, where there is no quid pro quo, where there is no Caesar lording it over you, where there are no demands of gratitude, where there's nobody saying you can't have this loaf of bread unless you say thank you. But instead, the bread is there for all. The gifts of every person to be celebrated. There are no boundaries to your strengths being exercised. The gifts that you have to give the world given fully without anyone saying no. That is the dream of God throughout the whole of the Hebrew scriptures. And it is the dream that Jesus talks about all through his ministry. Jesus dreams that that age to come, that time when gifts will flow freely, when we live in a universe that is just graced, will become obvious and evident to every single creature that lives. And that we will know that grace so deeply and so richly that it will transform our lives and transform our communities and transform even our politics and our economic systems. So that when you get the giving of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, what do you get? You get people who share all things, who know that nothing belongs to them but instead that it is all God's gift and that everyone, everyone is invited to the table. It's a moral vision. Gratitude in the, in the Bible is a moral vision where the two systems of gratitude are constantly contrasted. The system of Caesars and Pharaohs, that is a system of gratitude that demands something when gifts are given that always is saying to beneficiaries, I am the benefactor, you owe me a debt of gratitude. And to that, God just laughs. Because God knows that there, there is no such thing as a Caesar who is a benefactor or a Pharaoh who is a benefactor. It just doesn't work that way because Caesar was given gifts just like the poorest peasant in the Mediterranean world. And Caesar would not be alive without the God who breathed life into the universe. That Caesar's life, just like your life, just like my life, just like everyone's life is a gift and that we can never be benefactors unless we are first recipients. And we are all recipients. There is not one of us who gives without first having received. Sorry, mom, who taught me it was more blessed to give than to receive. But the truth is, is that none of us can give without receiving. And that's the nature of things. And with God's giftedness, there are no demands. That's really what we call grace. Free gifts. Free gifts. The Protestant reformers said that grace was the most radical doctrine in the whole of the scriptures. And it was one that the church most easily forgot. They weren't kidding. God's gifts are free. 
no strings attached. There's nothing that you can do to earn any of them. What do we do with free gifts? <laughs> what do we do with free gifts? We keep trying to say, no, no, it can't really be free. But it really is. It's all a gift with no demand of gratitude attached. Instead, what happens is that we understand that the moral universe turns inside out, upside down and backwards. The moral universe is not one of demand. It's not one of obligation. But instead, the moral universe becomes one of freedom. That gifts surround us. Gifts are everywhere. That if we are in a position where we can be a benefactor, that our obligation is to never hold anyone in debt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are supposed to give and give freely, as freely as God has given to us. Benefact away and never expect a thank you note. And when we are on the side of receiving gifts, we are free. That we are under no obligation to return a gift to the benefactor. That circle of obligation has been broken by the moral vision of gratitude in the Bible that circle of obligation, that obligation, that reciprocal thing, the transaction, that Caesar, not Jesus. Instead, we are given gifts and our, and our response should be to give more away. We don't return back to the benefactor. Instead, we send gifts further out around the table. Not out of obligation, but out of joy. And that's what moral gratitude is about. Moral gratitude is about living in a system, an ethical vision of the universe that places gifts at the center, but gifts that are freed from debt and obligation. Just gifts. That was the vision of the garden. Adam and Eve, they were just put there with all those gifts and it wasn't a requirement that they do anything with it. God said, take care of it. Produce. Have fun. Multiply the gifts. Spread them around. You're going to have kids. Share. There's going to be more people here. And that's what it is. That is the morality of gratitude. We live in a universe of gifts. The circle of reciprocal obligation is broken. But the circle of the table is ever present. And our job is to keep pulling up chairs and making sure that everybody has something to eat. So this year, I don't feel particularly grateful because so many things have gone wrong. It's been hard. I felt lonely. I know you have too. We've been frightened. You know, would we even make it through the year? Would people we know die of, the, of, of COVID? What was going to happen with the election? What's going to happen with our jobs? I mean, I'm in, I'm in the same kind of boat that every one of you is in. I haven't felt grateful very much. It's been hard 
sad. I've cried every day since March. But you know what? We're part of this other thing. This other radical, amazing thing. Where we, as the people of God, are literally taken out away from a universe of, of, of gratitude indebtedness, of, a, of an immoral form of gratitude that demands our, 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 our loyalty, that demands our, our obligations. And instead, we have been translated into this other universe into a completely different moral world, a world where we are freed from debt and we free others from debt. And our job is to just keep passing on the gifts. And that has sustained me. It sustains me as I engage in political action. It sustains me as I think about justice. It sustains me in what I imagine to be the vision of the kingdom that is one day closer than it was yesterday. It thrills me that we live in this subversive vision of gratitude, one where gifts are free. Every lunch is free. where we know, we know that the systems and structures of this world are passing and that there truly is an age to come that is breaking in. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent. And those four Sundays are about just that. Listen for it. The birth is about to happen. The kingdom is coming. The table is being set. You might not feel it, but you can still do it. A blessed Thanksgiving to you all and live into the subversive power of gratitude. Amen.